Okay. Um, Yes, yesterday, we heard the inflation uh, was 8.35%. Uh, that's what it was when I was in college. It's hard to believe that we've gone back to that. That that was normal when I was a college student, but at that time, uh, wages were also going up by that amount. So people were getting 10% pay, pay raises every year. And uh, that's not the case now. So the situation now is, is much more uh, scary and, and destructive even, although we thought it was pretty destructive back then. The difference was back then, um, interest rates uh, rose in order to try to uh, dampen consumption. And uh, interest rates rose to 18%. I knew people that bought their first home with an 18% mortgage in the early 1980s. That's how, that's how different it was. Um, Nowadays, well, interest rates are coming up as well. I think the uh, mortgage rates are at five, five percent, which is really high by uh, recent standards. You know, we bought our, our home uh, 30 years ago. Next year, we bought our home here at seven and uh, seven and a half percent, and never refinanced it. So we still, we'll, we'll, it'll be paid off next year. Um, but seven and a half percent, we thought 30 years ago that was wonderful. I mean, that was like. Uh, and uh, I never wanted to refinance because I, refinancing costs money. But anyway, uh, this, is a, this is an unsettling time. It, it's not so bad you know, if you're a graduate because there are lots of jobs right now. The difference between when I was a student and now is when I was a student, um, because the interest rates went up, employers stopped hiring. And um, my year of graduation, uh, 1983, was an awful year. A lot of engineering students, a lot of my colleagues got, uh, had job offers and then they were taken back. They were rescinded. And that was the first time anybody had ever seen that. And, uh, and I was very lucky to have gotten a job. And I, was, I got a job because I did an internship. Uh, I was hired by the place I did my internship at. And um, I was not hired at some of the places I really wanted to work, uh, oil companies um, in particular. And uh, I ended up having to take job, which was just fine, um, but ever since then I've been a believer in internships because that saved me. I would have, I don't know what would have happened um, if I hadn't gotten that, but wow, difficult. And energy prices also just really going through the roof and even natural gas here in the U.S. Um, natural gas here is rising rapidly because we're exporting gas to other countries and so we're Americans for the uh, until a, a few years ago, gosh, not long ago, but until a few years ago, you could not export natural gas. And so if natural gas prices here were cheap, uh, that was the price. Even if it was uh, expensive in Europe or Japan or whatever, we still had cheap gas here. But now, because uh, gas producers can export gas to Europe and Japan, and they pay a lot more, it, it forces our prices up as well. And uh, so yeah, this is a really difficult difficult time, energy prices going up, and energy insecurity, especially in Europe, um, Japan to some extent, and more pressure now in Japan to restart their nuclear reactors. And I, I, I swear, I think people around the world are starting, you know, they, they started shutting down nuclear plants, I think you're starting to see a rethink. Um, especially if you've got plants that are still, still in good operating order and they're being shut down. Germany is finding itself in that position, and uh, they're having to burn coal, um, and uh, as a, you know, make up slack, and uh, and they'll also be, I, I guess, they'll be importing gas, maybe get importing gas from the U.S., but I guess we'll have to see. Um, but at least in that sense, we're kind of lucky in that we have we're an abundance of energy resources here. Um, it kind of shields us from the really sharp. Uh, spikes that other countries see. <clears throat> All right. Well, today we're uh, we're, we're starting uh, load calculations and um, cooling and heating, space load, and then system loads uh, next time. And this this all kind of runs together. My actually my notes for this uh, set of we're going through now. I, I, I won't have this until 
probably early next week. I, they're, they're, I have to write from scratch the way that I want to present the, this material because we're going to learn a, uh, a shorthand method for doing a load calculation on a building. These are very difficult. I think if you talk to HVAC engineers, um, they, many of them will say this is the most uh, laborious, the biggest headache in HVAC design. Uh, you remember from heat transfer class, even the textbook problems we did were complicated. When you start doing this in a real world situation where your, your environment is constantly changing, both your internal and your external environments are constantly changing, your analysis is transient. Um, it's enormously, enormously complicated, and, and you can't even do these by hand except for the simplest cases. Um, so there are uh, methods that have been developed to enable hand calculation when you're doing kind of a roughing things out. Nowadays, almost everybody does load calculations in, uh, in industry standard <coughs> software, um, where you, 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 you put in the uh, the location, the latitude and longitude, and it automatically downloads all of the climate data hour by hour, temperatures, humidity, wind speeds, based on average conditions. And then you build your building in the, in the, in the software. And so you have to pick out the components. Um, it requires going through massive lists of you know, catalogs of walls and windows and roofs. And uh, you literally, you know, it's like a, Lego, you sit there and you build your, well, the, the architect is giving you the general outline, but you're going to fill it in and, you know, lay out the duct work and that kind of thing. But uh, those programs will do the load calculations, but you still have to be able to interpret the output and, and, and be able to run checks to make sure you're getting the right stuff. And it all starts with the, the very basics that we learned last year in heat transfer, that Q equals what? It equals you know, something times delta T, right? <laughs> you remember that part? Q equals blah, 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 delta T. So your inside temperature, your outside temperature, and then there's something that goes in the middle there. And it's that something that goes in the middle that's the big problem, right? The, remember the muscle number calculations and um, uh, resistances, our, our values, those are, 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 are difficult to calculate. And, uh, you know, we would, in heat transfer class, you know, we would get the thermal conductivity, right? And we would calculate the thermal resistance based on thermal conductivity. And we can do that with uh, building materials as well. Um, fortunately, uh, standard building materials are, uh, somebody's already done that for us. And uh, uh, they've calculated the R values and those are standardized. And so you can look them up. We, in fact, we even label insulation by its, by its R value. And, um, and then for uh, components, you know, a, a, a co composite materials, like a composite wall that has multiple layers of insulation and uh, uh, maybe some uh, gypsum board and, and uh, stud and things like that, you can uh, look up the U factor. I don't know if you remember, but uh, we, we learned how to calculate the overall heat transfer coefficient U Mainly we use that with heat exchangers. And you may have even done that in the uh, lab as well when you did the heat exchanger labs, calculating or using the U value. And um, the U value is convenient when you have composite structures. So you've got many materials, materials in series, materials in parallel. And instead of having to calculate the U value for every single uh, 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 standard component, you know, the manufacturer has done that for us. So like all, all the windows, standard windows, we can look up the U value. So you have to put in, you know, what's the thickness of the glass? How many panes do you have? Is it aluminum? Is it an operable window or not operable? Um, you know, the kind of window and sash. And uh, so you look up the U value. And then with that U value and the square footage of the window, you can calculate the heat transfer, the heat loss or the heat gain. And um, actually in the winter, you know, for heating loads, it's not such a big deal. You just have to go, go through all your walls and ceilings and floor windows and calculate the heat loss through all those um, parts of the building enclosure. And uh, mainly that's conduction and convection. 
and convection is pretty straight, and it's all pretty straightforward. The problem is in the summer. Um, and the difference is that at night, you know, when you're, when you're calculating for winter time conditions, and you think, well, what's the coldest time? It's gonna be the middle of the night when people are sleeping and all the you know, little equipment is running. The sun isn't shining, and so almost all of your load is coming from conduction from inside, from outside to inside, and convection as the wind blows against the house. So you don't have to do a lot of, uh, you, you don't even really calculate the load from people, really, because um, people are not active, usually, uh, at the coldest time of the day in the winter, and the equipment is off. It's pretty straightforward. Summertime, totally different ballgame. Because then your peak cooling load, middle of the day, everybody's active, people are running around, all the equipment is humming, and the big fly in the ointment that, that just screws up the whole thing is the solar, the, uh, the effect of solar radiation. Because now you've got radiation coming in, and it, it's changing by the second as the sun moves across the sky, it's changing as clouds come in. And so the, the, you've got two big problems with solar radiation. One is that it's, it's highly variable, also, that the effect is highly transient because some of that solar energy comes in and it's immediately, it, it, you know, we, we, count, we did that in heat transfer, right? You know, it's uh, what, Q, Q equals the Stefan Boltzmann constant times A times the emissivity, not delta T, but the, the delta T, each, each temperature to the fourth power. Remember that? T to the four. T inside to the four minus T outside, or T outside to the four minus T inside to the four. So we can do that. The problem is that only some of the energy is coming that way. The rest of it gets absorbed by the walls, the glass, the uh, furniture, and the floor. It gets absorbed and uh, stored in those materials, and then it gets released later and gradually at night or you know, sometime thereafter, and capturing that transient effect is hugely difficult and practically impossible without computational uh, tools or, or some type of a, um, of a, of a, of a um, simplified method. And actually, that's what we're going to look at is a simplified method called the cooling load temperature difference method. It's the old-fashioned way of doing stuff by hand when um, before you had computers, and now that we have computers, you're doing things kind of a rough, uh, a quick and dirty, rough calculation of loads. But we can do some simple stuff. Um, you know, we can do hand calculations for you know relatively simple buildings for you know winter time. It's not too bad. Uh, it's really the summertime that we, we have to really run into trouble. And without that, without the sensible and latent space load, we can't begin to design our, our HVAC system. Um, so that's the problem. And another problem is a lot of the information that we need to do a proper load analysis, we don't know. Uh, it, we start the HVAC design relatively early in the construction project, and often we won't have the full details, especially about things like lighting. How many of what kind of lights are you going to have? How many computers are you going to have? floor, you might not even know how many people are going to occupy which spaces, and so the HVAC engineer is really stuck. I mean, you got to guess, you got to talk to people, try to get the best sense of what, you know, what's going to be in that space, and uh, you may have to make some adjustments later. Um, it involves talking to the building owner, and often the building owner, they're not HVAC people, they probably never had thermo, so they don't even know what they're talking about. All they know, just give me a comfortable building. All I want is a comfortable building. It's not rocket science. No, I'm sorry, it is rocket science. And actually, it's probably harder than rocket science. <laughs> rocket and physics is pretty well established. And, um, but it, it, it's hard. You know? And then you, know, you turn it over to the owner, and the owner, you don't know the owner's going to operate it according to the design. The owner may do something completely different. May, turn the office into a gym or something like that. And then you've got an HVAC system for an office, people sitting at a desk, you type it, and it's being used for something completely different. And uh, so it's a lot of uncertainties here. Before we get to that, um, and today we're just going to do some simple stuff, but 
today I, I want to finish uh, refrigeration cycles and, um, and talk about comfort. Because we really haven't said much about comfort yet. Uh, although this is kind of, this is the easy part. So we don't have a lot of complicated math. We have an exam coming up too in here soon, don't we? Is it yeah. next? Uh, is what's, what's today? Thirteenth. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's uh, it, it's a, it's 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 a week and a half. Yeah. Okay. Um. So around uh, probably before the exam, um, we're gonna we're gonna talk about the, the projects. There's, there's one uncertainty, is I'm still working on seeing if we can get a a, a project involving our own HVAC system here. Um, I did hear back from our facilities manager, and I I think we're gonna be able to at least go over and you know, inspect the HVAC system and get a sense of, and they may even come in and talk about it with us um, later on, but I, I'm hoping we can get a little, maybe they have a little problem they, we could solve or help them look at. Um, I'm gonna try to, because right now I don't have enough projects with uh, actual real world projects to go around, and I'm still hoping to get, pick up a couple more. Okay, um, so other refrigeration cycles, Okay, well, vapor compression, you know, it's probably 90% or more of air conditioning and refrigeration applications, but there are other ref ways to refrigerate, and one, you know, there's one that we're not even talking about, thermoelectric refrigeration, which takes advantage of uh, the fact that when, when dissimilar metals are brought to contact uh, and current flows uh, across them, or you know, potential across them, you can actually uh, remove energy from the surrounding. Um, that, that, that's good for like very focused cooling. Um, like if you need to cool a, a very tiny little area, spot cool. Um, some people are looking at that for possibly larger applications, um, which would be great because it, it doesn't rely on uh, refrigerants and environmentally damaging kinds of things. But uh, we're not gonna talk about that. That's pretty minor in building, certainly what we're talking about. But absorption uh, is significant. Um, this is the, when you really need, you've got a really big refrigeration need or you're air conditioning a really large building or a campus. Um, absorption cycles or an absorption system is the way to go. And um, UW Seattle has one of these. And uh, you often, when you, you'll often see these co-located with the power plant, the building power plant. And the reason is that to run an absorption cycle, you need a source of heat. Uh, in this case, uh, we're showing solar energy, and solar is, is a good source, um, solar thermal, um, because you need heat to run the process. Um, and uh, with a power plant, um, you can take advantage of the steam, especially if you have extra steam, or steam that might get wasted, or not used, you can uh, run that steam, use it as a source of heat, in the absorption cycle. You also see these in uh, uh, big hospitals that might have large cooling needs. And um, as you can see, if you look at this part of the cycle, you know, three fourths of the cycle looks identical to vapor compression. The condenser, throttling, uh, evaporator. But then the difference here is that uh, when we get to the vapor state, um, in, in vapor compression, we would compress the vapor. Now, as you know, compression is uh, energy intensive, compressing gas, because you're, you're shrinking it, you're squeezing it like a ball, you know, like a balloon. Um, you're compressing it down, and that, that takes a lot of energy. And that energy use goes up dramatically when you get to very large flows, like you would have in a big system. Um, you also make maybe a giant cold storage facility where you're storing frozen goods of some kind, food. Um, and uh, 
What this does, the real reason you would use absorption is that you replace compression with pumping. Okay, you replace compression with pumping. So what you do is when the vapor comes out, instead of going to a compressor, it's a gas. Um, we take this and dis we dissolve the gas in a liquid, a solvent. In this case, this is there's actually only two types of systems in common use. One is uh, it's called the ammonia water system, which is shown here. In this system, ammonia is the refrigerant, and water is used to absorb the ammonia because ammonia dissolves in water. So you bring the uh, ammonia out and it goes into this tank that has water in it. It's a big tank of water, and this water, it, the, the, the ammonia dissolves into the water. Now, that's an exothermic process. So it, it generates heat. You have to have a way of getting rid of the heat. So you need a little bit of cooling water here to come in and, and, and draw that heat away. But then you've got a, a water ammonia liquid mixture that you can pump up to the condenser pressure. And pumping, because it doesn't change specific volume, uh, pumping doesn't take a lot of energy. It's much cheaper than compressing to move the same amount of material. And uh, so we pump the uh, ammonia water up to the condenser pressure, but then we have to, uh, when it gets up to that pressure, we have to get the ammonia back out. And that's where you need some source of heat. It's not a lot of heat. It, it's, it's just a modest, it's heat that's not really, you know, it's high entropy heat. You can't really use it to generate power. Um, it's, you can heat with it. But, um, so we just take that, uh, we just heat up this solution. And, um, and then the reverse of what, what happens here is the reverse of what happens here. The ammonia gets driven out and this just uh, purifies. It, it, it removes any residual water vapor and we get the ammonia back to go and condense, ammonia vapor. And then the water uh, just goes back down and gets recycled. And uh, um, because of, uh, you, you want the water here to be cool um, because the, the colder the water is, the more easily the ammonia is going to dissolve in it. But then it's going to heat up anyway as you heat it. So you want to try to get this water back down, get it as cool as you can. And so you have this little heat exchanger here. It's, this is convenient because you, you, want to, you want this to be hot because you're, you're heating it. So th this is a way you get kind of a two for one. You, 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 you preheat the ammonia water mixture before it goes in. That's going to reduce the energy input here. And because you're transferring heat from this water here, you're helping to cool that down. Now you can run this without this heat exchanger. It's just going to be more expensive because you're going to need more cooling here and you're going to need more heat there. So this makes it a little more economical. Um, so that is the absorption cycle. And there's ways we can do design calculations with it, but I, given all the other things that we do in this class, um, I, I chose not to include that because I'm thinking it's, this is a, very much a boutique application that not many of us will ever, uh, I think, encounter. Although you might if you do hospital uh, HVAC or you know, really, really big systems. Um, and they're not really difficult. It's, it's, there's just a little piece that we add on and we have to use some charts to figure out uh, solution, uh, uh, what rate, uh, you get into vapor, uh, solvent vapor pressures and things like that. It's just a little bit extra thermodynamics that we have to mess around with. So we're not going to do calculations, but we just want to understand conceptually how this works. So liquid to absorb refrigerant, um, and this just describes what I, what I said. The other type is a water lithium bromide. And that's interesting because in the water lithium bromide, we use water as the refrigerant. So instead of ammonia, you use the water as the refrigerant, and then you use a, a lithium a bromide solution here. That's actually what UW Seattle has in their system. 
Yes. Yeah, I wanted to ask for the first part for the ammonia. Mm -hmm. uh, are the properties similar for uh, for ammonia versus say R one thirty four A? Or is yes. Okay. Ammonia is actually R seventeen. So if you ever see R seventeen, that's ammonia, and that's a that's a free relatively common refrigerant and it's becoming more common because it uh, it's natural and it doesn't have any environmental it doesn't harm the environment okay thank you yeah and so you can it has the same uh, P, kind of pH diagram that we see with the other refrigerants so we can analyze um, in fact uh, you find ammonia you can have just a regular vapor compression cycle that uses ammonia um, yeah okay and uh then another kind of cycle um, that also has very special, even more specialty application than the, than the absorption is a, a Brayton cycle. Uh, Brayton cycle used for refrigeration. And uh, let's see a, a diagram here. And uh, sometimes it's called the, uh, just a gas cycle, a gas refrigeration cycle, because the refrigerant stays in the gas phase. And, and usually it's just air. It's just air. It's like an air standard cycle, but used for refrigeration rather than power generation. And with this cycle, you can get to really, really low temperatures, down to about a minus 150 degrees. Um, on the downside, it's very inefficient. It's, it's a real energy hog. It has like a COP of 0.4 or 0.5, something like that. Um, so it's not something you want to use on a, for ordinary purposes. And um, so the Brayton refrigeration cycle, very low COP, uh, but it's, a, it's also a lightweight system. The components are, are portable, and uh, this makes it well suited for aircraft, for, uh, for air, air conditioning the inside of, uh, of the aircraft. So you have a homework problem, actually, that when you do some calculation. And if you think about it, this is just great. This is great for an airplane, right? Because you're getting a twofer here, you're getting cooling, but you're also getting power output from the turbines. So commercial airplanes use the turbines on their Brayton air conditioning cycles to for auxiliary power to, to run stuff in the cockpit and things like that. And what they do is you know, you've got the big compressor on the jet engine, and you just bleed off a little bit of the air uh, when it's still relatively low pressure. It's not really super high, but you, you bleed off a little bit of uh, of air and uh, it's hot, you know, because it's been compressed, so it's quite warm. Uh, so you want to cool that down, and you can do that easily because, uh, you know, you're, you're flying, the, the air outside the cabin is very cold, so it's easy to cool stuff up there. And uh, so you, you transfer energy from the air to the surrounding, and, uh, and then you run it through this, this uh, uh, heat exchanger here that, uh, We'll, we'll, we'll actually get it even uh, cooler. Um, and then you expand it in a turbine. And that expanding it in the turbine pulls the temperature down. You run the turbine so that the output here is close to what you want the cabin, the inside uh, pressure. So you want this around 14, 15 psi uh, coming off the turbine here, and then it goes into the uh, cabin, and it's not changing phase, so this is not an evaporator, it's just a heat exchanger, and it has a fan that draws the cabin air across it. This is nice and chilly, nice and cold, and uh, you, know, you, get, uh, you get some nice cooling out of it. Um, and then we just take it back into the uh, compressor. So we look at the cycle here. Um, so our QN happens during the air conditioning. So from four to from four to B, we're absorbing energy from the cabin. And this is the temperature, cabin temperature here. So we're putting it into the cabin. You know this temperature here. And then we come out and we warm it up a little bit from B to one. So we're, this is helping to cool this stream down. And then from one to two, 
our compression, and this is being shown as an isotropic compression here. The real compression is going to be a little bit of entropy generation. Uh, and then we, we cool with the heat exchanger using the outside air, and that brings us to A, and then we cool a little bit more from A to 3, you're drawing some energy, further energy away from there. And then 3 to 4 uh, is our expansion. Um, and uh, yes, that works really well with aircraft applications, but it's not a, an efficient way uh, to do air conditioning at ground level. Uh, unless you're, you're trying to refrigerate something to pretty low temperatures, then it works pretty well. So that's kind of cool. You can do a little Brayton cycle analysis. And um, so I've got a homework problem for you to do this, you know, with an air, not uh, yet with uh, the cold air standard, you just assume constant specific heat. So you don't need an air table uh, to, do, to do this. Just a, and, and it's pure air, so we don't have to worry about a water component. Um, in fact, the air that we draw, uh, we're, we're drawing out of the uh, uh, out of the ambient air is very dry up at uh, cruising altitude. Okay, um, and uh, actually, this is, uh, I guess, what a more uh, an a design more specific for. Uh, air conditioning of the aircraft cabin, such as showing the power generation and the air going into the cabin. So it's um, it's not a true cycle the way a Rankine cycle is, because the air the air is continually recycled, but um, I guess it's the same as a break, just a, a break power cycle, the same way. Um, yeah, it's a pretty cool application. Uh, but again, very minor part of, of air conditioning. Now, just some uh, thinking, looking at different ways that we, we mate the refrigeration cycle to the rest of the air conditioning system. So refrigeration plus the air handling and uh, in some cases water handling and distribution. So just going to look at some general system types here. The simplest being the window air conditioner. And the window air conditioner is part of this uh, a larger category called unitary packaged systems. And what that means, unitary, it's just everything is in one box. And that means the refrigerator plus the fans and air handling and everything all, all in one. Um, so these are great for single room applications, maybe, maybe a couple of small rooms, up to about 12,000 BTU, maybe one ton, half a ton to one ton. Um, when I was growing up, we had these all over the, where I lived in Virginia before moving here, and that was our air conditioning. <laughs> I didn't even have these until I was like 10 years old. Little kid, uh, we didn't have air conditioning at all. But uh, it's kind of neat. This is a double fan here, uh, where you run the condenser fan and the evaporator fan off the same motor in the same shaft. It's kind of cool. Um, and then you go up a step to um, a through the wall unit. Many ways similar to a room air conditioner, but a little bit larger. And these tend to also have uh, heating built in as well. So you find these in hotels, and, uh, off, you know, some smaller commercial buildings and things like that. Not so much in houses. Uh, they're kind of big, a little bit expensive, bulky. Um, but they're nice when you have individual, or even apartments, I guess, might have these for an all-in-one heating plus air conditioning. Um, and then the next step up would be you know, the big boxes that look like dumpsters sitting on rooftops. Right, you seeing those? 
really, really common, especially on grocery stores and big box stores and uh, you know, wherever you can actually put one. Uh, the challenge here, you know, these are heavy, so you have to have structural support, support uh, adequate support on the rooftop. You also need a flat roof, but you can also put them outdoors as well, or, uh, or on the ground, not, not outdoors, but put it on the ground. And uh, again, all in one, but things are a little spread out here. You see the condenser coil, and the evaporator coil, the fan, compressor, and uh, the condenser fan, which is uh, rejecting the heat to the ultimate heat rejection to the environment. And there's a furnace built in as well, maybe a gas or an oil furnace, so we can have heating in the winter. Using the same air handling system, this is a very simple one. Not really much duct work here, but uh, and often you see these, they, they sit over the space that they're directly uh, conditioning. So usually for single zones, so you might zone off part of the building and it would, it would be conditioned by this, uh, this system here. Uh, the return air coming in and then the outside air coming in to mix. These have problems controlling humidity um, and uh, they often overcool. You get too much cooling that causes the humidity to go up and you get mold and things like that. So they're not great when you have uh, in really hot, humid environments or when you need to have really good humidity control. And then we get to the split systems where we break up part of the system and put it part of the outdoors and part of the indoors. And you're starting to see these more in homes. Um, I just had one of these put in last summer. My home, I didn't have air conditioning until last summer. Now I've got one of these pretty things I can look at in my backyard. Um, this one, yeah, I went in there and looked around to see how it was laid out. And it looks just like that. Um, so uh, in this situation, when if it's, a, if, it's a, 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 if it's just an air conditioner, all it does is air is, is cooling, then we've got a permanent evaporator in here and a, a permanent condenser out here and the compressor is also uh, located out there. And then the air, air handling system uh, supplying our building, it has a fan and, uh, and, and, and a furnace built in. Um, so the natural gas hook up here. So uh, in the summertime, we just close, we just shut off the refrigerator, the refrigeration system in the wintertime, we shut off the refrigeration system and we just run this as a, as a heater. And uh, burning the gas creates a, a lot of heat here. That's just a heat exchanger from the hot gas to the, to the air. And then in summer, the furnace turns off and we use the same fan and uh, blow the air across the nice cool evaporator to get our cooling. <coughs> And then we go up a step, we can get to the uh, heat pump. You know, we saw last time, this is a, a heat pump that can be used for heating and cooling. So it has the reversing valve that allows you to change the direction of refrigerant flow so that this is a condenser in the winter when you want heat and an evaporator in the summer when you want cooling. And uh, you can see the different, showing the different directions for heating and cooling. Um, but everything else is pretty much the same. These are a lot more expensive, a lot more expensive. I, said, I was surprised at a uh, good grief, at least 50% more expensive for the same level of, like last summer, last summer I had this put in. Well, I already had the gas furnace, but um, yeah, this was so much more expensive. I, I couldn't budget. I didn't have to budget for it. So I'm like, God, I know I want to. I want to go green. I want to go electrify. But you know, we got just like electric cars. You know, you get to, at some point the price needs to come down so ordinary people like me and you can afford to, <laughs> can afford to buy them. Um, these are also more. They need more maintenance. They're uh, this the, the, the mechanical system is a lot more complicated. 
reversing flows and valves and things like that. So you've got a little bit more maintenance to worry about as well. Um, and then we have, um, what do we have here? Oh, and then you get into like what 21 Acres has, where we just saw it. The previous slide was a, an air an air to air heat pump. Now here we have a water to air heat pump, where our um, instead of our um, our thermal sink it isn't the air now, but it's actually the, the ground, which is a much better. You know, these are much more efficient systems because the ground stays at a constant temperature, whereas the air temperature is always changing. And as the outside air temperature changes, the COP is changing constantly with an air source heat pump. And this one you've got uh, you know, 50 degree plus or minus a few degrees year round, and you bring that water in, and um, it, uh, it it exchanges energy with the refrigerant. So in uh, in cooling mode, the uh, the, re the refrigerant would be rejecting heat to the water here. And in heating mode, this would be the uh, evaporator, and energy would be going from the water to into the refrigerant. So in the wintertime, you'd be refrigerating the water here. In the summertime, you're warming it up. And, um, and then the rest of the, of the system, the evaporator, the uh, throttling, the compressor are mostly the same. This is a little more complicated because it also is uh, heating water. The water heater, and uh, so you have another little coil over here that, uh, that heats water from the hot water heater. It's a very versatile and very energy efficient and very expensive in most, in most places. <laughs> But uh, they have one of these at 21 acres, and I hope some of you will will, 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 will take on the project, go over there and check it out. It's, it's a pretty cool setup to see how that works. Um, and this is what makes them expensive, is you have to have ways of bringing that, uh, bringing a fluid of some kind from the ground to the uh, your building here. Now, in most situations, this would be an antifreeze solution, because you, know, you don't want to use just water because it could freeze. So you use some kind of a water antifreeze mix, and it's just moving between the refrigerant, that it's, it's moving between the unit in the house and, and the ground. It's just going round and round. And so you want lots of surface area so the fluid can give up heat or receive heat uh, as needed. And this is showing one configuration if you have a small building area, and then you go down, and if you have lots of building area, lots of yard space, you you go uh, shallow, but you spread out over a larger area. And uh, this is the way I know a lot of them are being done now, using this sort of slinky, it's called a slinky coil configuration. Again, giving you lots of surface area. And if you're really lucky and you live near uh, a source of geothermal water, and I think this is the case. This is actually the case at uh, at, at 21 acres. Um, instead of I'm not sure they're they're using geothermal water or an antifreeze solution of some kind. But if you have a water source, a, a, an underground spring, or a well, or even a river or a lake, you can bring that water in and uh, use that as your your thermal sink or thermal source, and, uh, and and you don't have to you don't have to construct all this elaborate piping. Um, so anyway, that is uh, you know that that is if you can do it. This is the most efficient, most energy efficient way to heat uh, and cool because you're almost all of your exchange of energy is happening with the ground. And very little, relatively speaking, coming from electric power to, to run the system. Um, and then moving to the highest, you know, the most sophisticated level of, uh, of cooling, when you've got a big building like this, 
or where we are here is a chilled water system. And now you're not refrigerating the air uh, directly, but you're using water, cold water as an intermediary, or hot water if you're heating. So now the refrigeration, the refrigeration unit, it's big enough, it's just a separate piece of hardware that sits in a mechanical building somewhere. Or in the basement of the building, maybe, and it makes cold water um, generally about 40 degrees, 45 degrees cold water, and then that goes out to all the places where you want to use it, and then when you have a, uh, a building space, you put a, a little box above the room that has a fan. This is actually what it looks like. Um, it has a, now, now you have a, um, you have a cooling coil that has cold water in it, it looks a lot like a refrigerant evaporator, except that you're running cold water through the tubes instead of refrigerant. So the cold water comes in, and you've got a fan that sucks room air in, blows it across the cold water coils, and then out into the uh, out into the space. And uh, uh, it's some some systems also have heating coils as well, so you can have a separate. Like a lot of buildings will have a boiler to make hot water. So in the winter time, you can uh, you shut that off and you have hot water there, and that makes warm air. And then a lot of buildings nowadays have both. They have systems that are called four-pipe systems. This is a two-pipe system. A four-pipe system, you can have both. Uh, you, you would have another uh, coil here that would be connected to your, uh, your source of hot water, which would normally be a boiler of some kind. Or it could be a uh, could be a, a heat pump as well. And uh, that's what we have. Um, actually, this is a four pipe system. That's that's the two pipe fan coil unit, and then the four pipe fan coil showing the uh, the connections to the hot water supply. Now these systems can be elaborate, and they can be difficult to it can be difficult to, to design the piping system. Because what happens is you probably, your intuition would suggest if you're serving a whole bunch of different locations with a single pump, you know, by the time you get out to the end, there's not going to be a lot of pressure left. And um, these, these folks down here are going to get starved with water, and these folks are going to get blasted with water. And there's actually little tricks you can employ in your design to balance things out. So pressure is roughly constant in each of the fan quilt um, And this one is set up so you can actually pipe in the hot water when you need it, taking advantage of the same pipes as, as the cold water. Except this, the downside here is you can't have simultaneous heating and cooling. You can have one or the other. But a lot of buildings today, uh, you have heating and cooling going on at the same time. Some spaces might be heated, while other, other places, spaces are being cooled. And so the four pipe system gives you more versatility. And, uh, and then the chilled water uh, chillers, what these look like, and these can get really, really big, really big, thousands of tons of cooling. Um, and if you were able to cut open the condenser and the evaporator, this is what they would look like. You'd see them filled with water and uh, refrigerant flowing through those many, many pipes. Again, maximizing surface area of contact between cold refrigerant and water, or in the condenser between the hot refrigerant and, and the cool water. Because the other thing about these systems is that the condensers, you no longer can just blow, have a little fan blowing air over the, over the condenser. You, you, you need really intense cooling going on here to, to uh, draw the heat. I mean, you've got a whole building. Imagine a, you know, skyscraper, a giant, even a you know, our campus here on a hot summer day. All of the heat, all of the heat that's being taken out of this building, is right there in that, <laughs> right there in the refrigerant, in the condenser. That's hot stuff. You got to get rid of that heat, and this is where you need a, a, a whole water system set up to, to do that. And um, and these. These, these have a very standardized design. Generally, you only need about 85 degrees of water here. 
It doesn't have to be cold water. 85 degrees is sufficient. Water has very high heat capacity, great for cooling. Bring it in at 85 degrees. It runs through the condenser and it absorbs the heat from the refrigerant and it comes out at 95 to 100 degrees. And you take it up to the cooling tower and, uh, and you take advantage of it backward to the cooling there as that, as that hot water trickles down. This is actually has filling in it. It has lots of, uh, it's stuffed with packing material, like little weird shaped things. So when the water comes down, you know, it can't just fall straight down. It actually has to trickle down all these little passages. So it takes a long time and it contacts a lot of surface area as it comes down. And while it's making its way down, air is, is going up so that air is picking up the heat. And what's happening is um, that the hot water, the heat from the hot, wa uh, the heat from the hot water, um, when you blow the air, you get convection going across it, it facilitates evaporation. So a little bit of this water evaporates when it comes into contact with the air. And as it does, you get evaporative cooling, where both the air cools and the water cools at the same time. So you end up with, down at the bottom here, 85 degree water that you can put back in. Uh, and coming out of the top is saturated air, air that's 100% humid. And, um, and then that that's, carries away the building's heat. That's your ultimate heat sink to the surrounding. We might get into how these are designed and how you do design calculations. I cover that sometimes. I can't remember if, actually, I don't think we're doing that this, uh, this time. But the cooling towers are pretty fun, pretty interesting. But generally, we don't sit down and design them. I mean, it, it, it's, it's sold as a package with the air conditioning. You know, we spec the, uh, the, the refrigeration system. This, this will come with this. So we, so we say what we need, what my refrigeration need is, and then the supplier packages the cooling towers to go with the refrigeration. And uh, I got a little interesting video here. The, um, we, we just replaced uh, a, ch a chiller here, one of our chillers. And uh, I recently learned that we have this video showing the installation. And uh, I don't think we need sound because it just plays music. But it gives a sense of uh, what, it, what these systems are, what it takes to put them in, just how big they are. So we can, yeah. That was the old one, so the old one goes out. Whoa. So it's a new one coming in. Man, look at how big that thing is. There's a compressor up top, and I think that's the, that's the evaporator. That side, this is the condenser, I believe.
uh, chilled water pumps. There's big pumps. That we get to start out, but anyway, I can try to get us over there and get them to show up, show us around, and explain how it works. And, and the last time I did this uh, a few years ago, they came in and talked, and they, they like they spoke this language that was just, nobody understood. It was like each back tech language. And I, I even had trouble, I mean, they're using all these abbreviations and, uh, and, 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 and metrics and ways that it's like, oh, we need, we need an explanation, an interpreter. What's all this stuff mean? Um, that's really interesting. I, I love to talk to the HVAC techs when they come out and do stuff, but the, the way they look at the system as techs and the way we're looking at it as engineers is, is quite different. And it's hard to, Find a place where you're actually mutually un <laughs> can understand each other. Um, my philosophy, you know, if I had, you know, if I could choose the best education system, it would be learn to be a technician first, and then practice that for a while, and then do the engineering part, because then you have a sense of how the nuts and bolts and everything works. There's a university in Japan uh, that has a mechanical engineering program. It requires or actually, as part of the curriculum, they first uh, train you to be a mechanic, an automobile mechanic, um, and you get a mechanics uh, certification, and then you continue on to get the, the, the B&E. Uh, that, that's pretty cool, and I think they managed to do that in four years, too. I might be fine, but uh, it's kind of cool. Yeah, so that is, uh, that's refrigeration. Um, I guess we'll take a little break here, and, and we'll sit talk a little bit about the about the uh, uh, comfort, thermal comfort, and then we'll go into the heat transfer stuff. Uh, I gotta go to the bathroom. So yeah, I think it's Saturday. Are you going to stay after? I've, I've got. I've got for later on the day because I've got like a 2 30 and I'll be back probably about 5 30. So I'll stay after, see if there's anything. If not, I'll take a look at the <laughs> no, it's like this It's actually I It's like a sit-down Oh, Kurt? I'll send you some. Okay, so when we think about comfort, um, this gets us to you know, think about the purpose of what the purpose of HVAC is, which is to really helping the body to control its own 
temperature to, re to regulate its its own uh, metabolism to uh, promote comfort. And uh, the goal here, you can't please everybody. Um, different people, comfort is subjective. But the goal is to please at least 80% of people in the building at any one time. That's actually an ASHRAE standard. We're supposed to try to design around that. And there actually, there's a science behind this. And they get people, and they, every few years they do these studies. They put people in rooms and change the temperature and humidity and things like that and get them to uh, answer surveys about, you know, is this comfortable? What do you think of this? How about that? And, and they register the results. And, um, and that gives them a sense of what the average, or they can group people by percentiles into what uh, levels of comfort or what uh, conditions they find to be comfortable. Uh, and comfort is, uh, in, 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 uh, in environmental health, are, this is one of the areas where we really have to be careful because the regulations are strict. They are encoded in ASHRAE standard 55 uh, there's just there's a few standards, 55 and 62 being the main ones that uh, we really should have on our desk at all times. So at least you know probably our employer will have it. But if we're working on our own, you want to have this handy because it has the rules and design guidelines and things like that. And uh, what happens is the uh, state governments and local governments and sometimes even the federal government will adopt the ASHRAE standard as the minimum standard. You can go better than that, but this standard becomes the, uh, the minimal for uh, designs that are compliant with, 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 uh, with, with codes, building codes. Um, and if you look at what is defined as the comfort range, um, it depends on the, on the season and it depends on what people are wearing. The target condition in summer is 77 degrees, 45% relative humidity, and in the winter, 72 degrees and 50% relative humidity. But there is a range, uh, an acceptable range around that, and that's what the psychometric chart on the right is showing. The relative humidity sweet spot, 45, uh, 40 to 50% in the winter, and, and really not below 30%, because then you get into problems with the, you know, the nasal passages drying out, bloody noses, and things like that. People get sick, you get the you know, sick building syndrome, is actually the name of the illness that people get. Um, and uh, so, so the winter, this is a, uh, the clo is a unit of heat transfer resistance for clothing. So the larger the clo, the, the more clothing, you know, the, the more uh, the heavier the clothing. So the winter time, uh, on average, 1.0 clo would be how people are dressed. And this would be for indoors. So, you know, a little bit heavier shirt and long sleeves and things like that. Summertime, short sleeve and a uh, little lighter clothing. And uh, so you can see the range here and the temperature, you know, as the, as the humidity goes up, the, the temperature goes down. You know, the temperature that corresponds to com comfort. And, um, and that's what we're, we're supposed to be keeping in mind do our design. Um, and then you don't want to go above 60% uh, humidity, generally because of uh, molds and things like that. Air quality issues become up. odors. Uh, dew points, keeping dew points above 35 degrees. You get below 35 degrees and you increase the chance of having condensation somewhere in the building. And you absolutely do not want condensation in the walls or the, uh, in the roof in, inside the, uh, the building enclosure. Um, thinking about comfort, it really starts with a thermodynamic analysis of the body. And this is an application of the first law to, uh, to the body. Uh, we have the in, internal ge energy generation, which is uh, metabolic uh, activity from all the stuff going on, processing of our food things like that, generating energy which leave our body in the form of work, mechanical work, so this would be exercise, walking, or moving equipment, um, minus the energy um, that is just conducting out and going into the environment if the environment's colder. 
This would be conduction and convection. And then respiration, which is carrying away some sensible and latent energy as well. And then that's equal to the rate of change of our body uh, energy level. And, uh, and then this is going to depend on uh, activity levels. Um, there's a, an actually a unit that's used in more in, in medicine, I guess, exercise physiology and nutrition and things like that, called the MET, which is uh, what one MET is 350 BTU per hour, which is about the, the energy generated when you're sitting at rest, maybe sitting in your classroom or something like that. Actually, uh, this would be even more at rest than in the classroom, unless you're actually sleeping in the classroom. <laughs> you would none of us do that or do that. Um, I hope the instructor doesn't do that, at least. Um, so comfort in the body. So the minimum generation of heat, you know, it's going to be around 350. They're just sitting, vegging out on the couch. Up to about 1,100 pound, uh, 1,100 with heavy work and exercise and things like that. Inside the body, very, very tight regulation around 98.5, 96, 98.6, 37 degrees C, I think it is. Um, but the skin temperature can vary a lot depending on you know, the surroundings. And uh, got good insulating properties with our skin. And, uh, Actually, thermal conductivity of skin, I'm thinking 0.21. I might be wrong. And that, that would be an SI. Uh, I, I don't know what it is in English. But uh, and the metabolic rate uh, depends on the body surface area. You know, how much of our body is exposed? What, what kind of clothing are we wearing? The surface area of our body depends on our body mass and height, and it's actually this empirical formula that we can use. Um, and we really wanted to start and design an HVAC system from the very first principles so we can start here. Okay, how, how many people, you know, let me, I want everybody's height and weight. <laughs> now I want to calculate total surface area of every body. And then, you know, we can predict, uh, and then, you know, what are you doing? And then based on total surface area and what you're doing, we can calculate a, a load that's flowing into the surrounding. So that's the formula that relates a uh, uh, surface area of the body to ma uh, body mass, pounds, and this is height in inches. I, I have no idea what the formula is in SI units, but that's English. Um, and we can divide that into sensible and latent components. Um, and interestingly, um, when we're at rest, you know, that, that's when we're, most of our heat transfer is coming as sensible heat. Um, is as we increase our activity, the sensible part actually drops. It starts to drop off and we get a latent energy. So as we're exercising and increasing our, our, our activity, our sensible heat is going, actually starts to go down and our latent component goes up. Um, at 70 degrees, about 290 BTU per hour is sensible and 110 of latent heat or lost. But at 80 degrees, look at this, at 80 degrees Fahrenheit, um, the sensible part near zero. And uh, now, yeah, I, I said that wrong. I said as, as we exercise, I mean as the, uh, as, the, as, the, as the environment that we're working in as the temperature goes up, our sensible component goes down and our latent goes up. Um, and then these are some, uh, basically how much energy gets produced, uh, metabolic heat generation for different kinds of activities uh, per square foot, so per unit of, uh, of area. So we can multiply that by the area. So you know, a really big person Lots of skin area, lots of surface area is going to have more heat generation than somebody who's tiny, a baby, or a small person. And uh, yeah, I think this, this was in our book, I think. And I think I have it in different sources. Um, in the conversion to MET, uh, so person at rest, respiration is about 30 BTU per hour. Sustained exercise, about 
1200 BTU per hour, half a horsepower, good workout. And, um, and then there are some, you know, there's some empirical formulas that we can use to estimate what room temperature would make a person comfortable based on their activity. And, um, uh, and this one here is, uh, this is a skin temperature at which a person feels comfortable. Um, and uh, sweating begins as activity level increases. And then this is uh, the prediction of latent load based on, uh, from sweating, based on the, the metabolic rate and the, the rate of work at which the person's doing work. Um, clothing adds thermal resistance, so we can look up what those thermal resistances are, just as we can of build, building components. Now, in uh, the temperature, we uh, to do a really exact analysis of, uh, of, of the room environment, we wouldn't use the dry bulb temperature or the wet bulb temperature. We'd use something called the mean radiant temperature, or the MRT. It's really complicated. It's very hard to figure it out. What you have to do is you literally have to have a thermometer on every surface in the room. So you have to have a thermometer here, you know, a thermometer on this podium, a thermometer on each desk. And what you do is you measure the temperature of all the surfaces, and you multiply them by the area. So it's like a weighted average of the temperatures of all the surfaces in the room. And that would be the mean radiant temperature. And, uh, and that is thought to be more accurate because it includes not just the temperature of the air, but it includes the temperature resulting from radiation. So radiation comes in, and it will cause some surfaces to be hotter than the surrounding air. Maybe some surfaces will be colder than the surrounding air. So that gives you a better indi indication of a more exact measure of the thermal condition in the room. Uh, but it is hard to, to calculate. There's a complicated formula that I don't even bother with. Um, I think that, you know, the software, the, the HVAC software will actually calculate that for us. Yeah. Okay. Plug in the climate computer, a bunch of other data. But anyway, um, a, a number that I prefer using is the optimal air temperature based on uh, our activity and our clothing. And uh, the second one here is actually my, uh, my preferred one because it takes into account our clothing, our ensemble of clothing, as well as our metabolic activity. So you can take a person, figure out their body area, what are they doing, then how much energy they're outputting, then what are they wearing, and then you can actually calculate what would be the ideal temperature to make that person comfortable. And that's what that formula will give you. And uh, so you may be, trying to cool or condition a space where you're doing some kind of strange activities. You know, maybe you're, this is a room where all you do is really intense exercise or something. So you, you want to condition it to maybe 40, 45 degrees. I mean, who knows? But you can figure out what it is and design your HVAC system accordingly. And um, there's all kinds of data on clothing, uh, R values. And what you do is you just start, you, what am I wearing? You look up the R value for each piece and add them up. How it's doing. Um, so there's a bunch of, uh, you know, I could take, uh, you know, what am I wearing now? I'm wearing, I'm wearing panties. <laughs> put on, you know, what is the resistance from panties? My long underwear, my uh, sandals and thongs, you know, sleeveless blouse, but you know, whatever it is, add them up and then plug them in that equation and figure out what temperature. Uh, I'm going to be comfortable with that. And this is something, you know, I, I don't know if it's, you know, if you really want to be exact and have a really good design, you know, try to figure out what people are wearing. If it's an office, you know, people are going to be dressed in you know, more dressy types of clothing. And uh, I even, you know, we even have tables like this for different parts of the world. So I, I was looking at, I think I mentioned in class, you know, I was looking at a table for uh, was like North Africa or something. It had all the different kinds of clothing that uh, people wear uh, in, 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 in that part of the world. Um, so this helps you to you know, really target your design to culture, people, how they're dressing, what they're 
doing in daily life. So what the, you know, some rules of thumb for floor temperature, our bodies are very sensitive to vertical variation in temperature. Um, we're not so sensitive if it's colder going up. We don't really notice if our head is colder than our feet, but we really, really notice if our head is warmer than our feet. And the rule of thumb is not more than five degrees between four inches above the floor and about five, five and a half feet above the floor. So people get really, they just get messed up when you get that kind of temperature. Supply air should be introduced. Um, uh, general rule of thumb, 12 to 30 degrees below the required air, air temperature when you're cooling to allow for that sensible warm up. And very, very important, we haven't really talked about this yet, is we're, we're controlling not just for temperature and hum humidity, but also for movement of the air. You want uh, some mixing of air, but you don't want people to feel like they're, you know, there are hurricanes in the room. People are really sensitive to that, and they complain. It's one of the things that makes people fall out of that 80% happy. No, I feel this draft all the time. There's just some air always, always blowing past me. Um, generally speaking, 25 feet per minute is considered still air. Anything below 25 feet per minute, and you want it maybe a little higher than that, 65 feet per minute, then people are like, wow, man, it's, it's really uncomfortable in here. Um, 50 feet per minute is a good average velocity for uh, when you come out of a register. So you've got air coming out of the wall here, and by the time it gets to the middle of the room, somewhere around 50 feet per minute is good. Uh, velocity that you want to be at. You know, you don't put registers like right there because I'm standing here, it's like, oh man, yeah, it's hot, it's cold. So you put them up. Ideally, you know, you want to have, um, you want to have heating vents, you want to have warm air coming out of the floor, right? You know, warm air coming out of the ceiling and warm air rises. <laughs> it's a nice way to heat the ceiling, but sometimes it has to be that way. Sometimes the architect doesn't give us space down here or for whatever reason, or maybe it's a retrofit, and we have uh, heating and cooling coming out. Like at my home, my vents are in the floor, my registers, and that's great for heat. It's designed for heating, but it's not so great for cooling. You know, the air, cold air comes out of the floor, but it doesn't get up high. Stratification, it's warm. I feel that, and it's, it bugs me, but there's nothing I can do about it, because I'm not gonna go drilling, putting new duct work and registers and adding a whole new set of uh, Conducting. So room air distribution, um, uh, very important, and we've got a whole section of the ASHRAE handbook just on the mechanical design of the registers and how you want to steer the air. There's a fluid mechanics around that that's kind of interesting. Uh, so 50 feet per minute at the envelope, 100 feet per minute uh, in the middle there. And uh, we talk about throw, you know, how far does this air go before it drops, you know, go out and it'll start to drop off. And, uh, and there's some guidelines for that. Um, standard 55, max air speed of 30 feet per minute, winter, 50 feet summer, um, total supply air flow rate for offices, just all these rules of thumb that we try to design with. And um, lots of different choices for registers and grills and you get into aesthetics, uh, what people like. Um, and then a metric that we, we use when we're designing this part of the system is called the throw coefficient. The horizontal distance the air travels in the direction of flow until the velocity drops to terminal velocity. And uh, 50 feet per minute is a, com a common one to work with. Um, you don't want your registers pushing the air out right beside the return air. Okay? This happens. I, I mean, it, this, this happens. Ex, you know, experienced engineers design a system, you got the air coming out, and then the return air is right beside it, so the air comes out and it goes right back in. <laughs> it comes out, shoo, shoo. It's like, uh-oh, whoops, somebody messed that up. Um, you, don't want, you don't want to do that. Um, so indoor air quality, uh, ash, we get to ASHRAE standard 62.1, um, and this also has energy uh, requirements in it. So, 62 is the other one with 55 that we should all be familiar with. And this didn't cost so much. I'd, I'd actually get copies for us all, but ASHRAE has a monopoly on these stupid things, and they just 
and mostly, mostly it's uh, 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 businesses to buy them, so it's, it's hard to get. I think we might have old versions in the library. Boy, I'll tell you, when I took the PE, you take the PE exam in, uh, in HVAC, um, we got to have all this stuff. Because a lot of questions won't be math questions, they'll be questions about regulations, and you have to have all the handbooks to look stuff up. So I had all the ASHRAE handbooks and all these standards, and I had a, a, a whole box of stuff, and I, had, I set up a little library when I took the exam. That's all out the windows. It's all, just like the FE exam, they give you one big book, and everything is in that book, and it's, it's, on, it's a PDF. But it's really, I couldn't imagine taking the exam now. I think they have to take out a lot of the questions about uh, uh, regulations and codes because you don't have those with you. Although they may expect you now to remember a lot of it. But I, I don't know because I haven't seen the new uh, PD exam for, for that subject. But anyway, um, so ventilation. Ventilation is hugely important. That's uh, what we're scheduled to, to focus on next time, is looking at how much ventilation do we need and how, we, how do we factor that into our design. Um, this is the outdoor air that we have to bring in. And it's very important because it, it's, a, it's a huge cost to, because you're conditioning outside air. Return air, it's already at you know, 70 degrees. It doesn't take a lot to break, bring that back down to 55, 60 degrees. But if it's 95 degrees outside and you're having to bring in a lot of outside air, that's costly, um, but uh, the, the, the quantity that we have to have, is the minimum is set by uh, standard 62, and then local building codes will even be stricter in some cases than that. Um, you, can even, you can also use natural ventilation um, and uh, mechanical is using, of course, fans and blowers. Um, and then if you, you know, specialized areas, kitchens and bathrooms have to have uh, extra ventilation to remove odors and moisture and things like that. Um, you can use ventilation for pressurization uh, to keep out it if you don't want it outside air coming in. So pre you pressurize the space. That will be, uh, you can see that in the hospital, for example. And, uh, and then filtration would be used to supplement ventilation to clean up the air even more. And this could be important in areas where you have lots of fires and smoke and things like that. And I think we're, 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 this is becoming more important, both because of COVID and the increased prevalence of smoke and fire. And, uh, well, and then you have special, you get into a Totally different area when you talk about tobacco, tobacco smoke, and smoking spaces. Before there were smoking spaces, you know, when people could just smoke anywhere, um, you had to take that into account when you're doing your designs. What, what percentage of people are going to be smoking? Uh, I remember working my first uh, like 10 years working as an engineer about letting people smoke in their offices. Actually, before coming here, I, when I was a professor, my first job as a professor, I taught at a place where professors smoked in their, in their office, not outside their office, but they smoked in their, in their offices. Things have really changed. Um, so we don't worry about that unless you're designing special rooms where people are smoking and then there's specialized filtration. Um, Restable suspended particles. Have to be mindful of below five micron. That's that's especially harmful getting into the lungs. Um, CO2, gas, radon. Um, CO2 especially, we're starting to see more monitoring of that to keep the building spaces fresh. Um, and, and certainly, you know, CO2 if it builds up, it can lead to uh, asphyxiation. People start to get light, uh, feel faint and uh, sleepy and you know, by that point, things are pretty bad. Um, most systems will activate and clear, ventilate a room well before you get to a, a state where you've, you've noticed the CO2. Um, activated carbon in filters where, you know, kitchens, that's especially common. Um, 
Yeah, so then you've got multi-zone systems, you get into this situation where different parts of the building need different amounts of ventilation. And at some point you've got a header, usually you'll have a common header coming in. Not, not always, but usually it's more economical to have a common ventilation header, and then you peel off to different zones. And in that situation, the, the zone that needs the, that has the worst air quality problems dictates the design. Um, and uh, rule of thumb, 20 CFM minimum outdoor air per person. And uh, that, that's just an absolute minimum. And there's standards uh, for whatever, what the, based on the purpose of the space and what people are doing. Yeah, we'll get more into that next, uh, next time. Um, or actually, here's a, it's kind of a segue into the next, next uh, thing. Looking at the different type of buildings, the function, and then there's a, a design occupancy. This is the maximum number of people per 1,000 square feet, and then how much ventilation that you're supposed to have per person. So 20 is kind of a minimum, it's 15, it's maybe older. Yeah, 2010. This, this is not current here. I think the one in our, our book would be current. Um, but for different areas, cocktail lounge. No, I don't see karaoke. We need karaoke. I'm, here. I'm gonna look up. What, what is it? What's the rule for karaoke? What is it? Um, so anyway, that's a so indoor air quality um, and comfort. So it's more, you know, qualitative stuff that we need to just keep in mind when we're doing. I just want to say, uh, kind of preface this, because when we talk about loads, we just need to start doing some calculation and see how we, we do load, load analysis, some heat transfer stuff. So this is what we're up against here. We've got to look at all of the sources of energy impacting our space, keeping in mind what comfort, you know, the le we've got to establish the comfort conditions in our space, and then we've got to look at all of the sources of energy coming into the space. So there's the outdoor ambient air, that is gonna filter into our space by conduction in the summertime. In the wintertime, it's gonna go out. This is kind of a summertime mapping here. Uh, heat coming from outside in through the walls and the windows and the roof and so on. We have solar radiation, so direct diffuse radiation, direct radiation, ground reflected and diffuse coming in, especially through the windows. Um, and some of that comes in, uh, in, in as direct heat into the space. Other parts of the uh, solar radiation are absorbed in internal surfaces. You've got the internal loads, all the people and the equipment, and all of that load on our space, moisture and sensible, latent and sensible energy. And this is what our cooling equipment has to do. It has to be moving this energy as it's coming in to keep thermal, uh, keep thermal equilibrium in the space. And, uh, and then we're rejecting the heat moisture to the surrounding. Um, these are the, this is the beginning of my, I'm sorry, I haven't posted these yet because they're not, you know, I see I don't even have a, I don't even know what that is. This is, a, this is still a draft. Infiltration and ventilation actually comes from what we read uh, from Monday's unit. Um, I'm starting here from old notes where I had a different text and uh, things were presented in a different order. So I, I, I'm in a situation where my notes don't really match the text and I'm going to try to change that. Um, ventilation. Okay, load from people. We, there's a technique that we have to use to take into consideration the heat generated by lights. And there's a formula for that and data, and that's uh, that's in the chapter for today. A lot of that you just have to look at and kind of glance through and see. I mean, there's a lot of tables, you know, 
How much does a computer monitor? How much heat goes into the space? And then how do I factor that in? So a lot of today's reading is just tables and equations for using that data to calculate the heat load on the space. So you get heat gains from, from equipment, heat gain through the building envelope, and this gets into uh, kind of a review of heat transfer. Um, we're looking for resistances, thermal resistances of building materials, but there's different ways of expressing thermal resistance. And this is where we run into some problems. Um, I think most materials have an R value. R is related to thermal conductivity K. You might remember we had, uh, we, we described re, uh, thermal resistance it is the, the length, it, it is the dimension of the material normal to the heat flow. So it'd be like the width of a wall, L, divided by its thermal conductivity, multiplied by the area, the cross-sectional area, right? That would be an R, where K is thermal conductivity. And then we can express, uh, we can calculate heat transfer by conduction as the difference in temperature between two points and the thermal resistance between them, where this is the thermal resistance. Is that really about, does that come back? No, actually, we reviewed this in epi prep class, but it's like the last, one of the last topics that we can come to. Um, now, in the, the R value that we see in building materials uh, is a little bit different from the thermal resistivity. It's actually uh, R times A. So it takes A out of the denominator. This is how we use R. We, we shouldn't say R value. This is thermal resistance. The R value we get when we multiply this by A. So A goes out of the denominator so we can talk about equipment in general rather than equipment of just a, some specific size. So our value is the uh, L or X, it's the X, X dimension for a wall over the thermal conductivity. And then if we write Fourier's law in terms of the R value, we have to put A uh, up, in the, up, up in the numerator there. And then for, uh, for some materials like insulation, materials that we, we buy at a specified dimension, like we would buy insulation, you know, four inches or six inches or eight inches uh, of thickness of insulation, instead of getting the R value for that, um, oftentimes we'll get the conductance instead, where the conductance is one over the R value, or K over X, So conductance reciprocal of the R value, just similar in electricity, electrical conductance is the inverse of resistance. <coughs> and, uh, and you can find uh, this information in uh, every imaginable material in the hash rate handbook and the building, uh, building handbooks. Um, and then when we have a composite uh, component with multiple materials, multiple R values, we want to have one term that describes the thermal properties of that material, and that would be the uh, overall heat transfer coefficient, or uh, in ASHRAE language, uh, U factor. It's called the U factor. Uh, and this is, a, um, this is a measure of how easily the material conducts heat. So the larger U is, the more heat is going to be conducted through that material. And uh, so generally, when we're doing a load analysis, we need to get all of our R values, and sometimes C values if it's conductance, and convert them into U, U values. And then we use U values in our calculation for the heat transfer. And then our heat transfer would be Q equals area times U times delta T. And uh, the nice thing about U 
the, the resistivity, the R, R values add. So if you have components in series, you add up their R values, you get a total R. Then you flip the R. You flip the R to get U. And the nice thing about U is it's additive by area. And what I mean by that is if half of my wall, okay, my wall, let's say my wall is 100 square feet. Let's say 50 square feet of that is window, and 50 square feet is, is wall. Then my U value is going to be 0.5 times U for the wall plus 0.5 times U for the window. And that gives me U that I use to calculate the heat transfer here. And uh, yeah, so this is the total thermal resistance in series. We just add them up. In some cases, not so often in, in building uh, systems, but sometimes we have uh, resistances in parallel, different materials parallel. We would have to uh, take the equivalent resistance um, using the equation 13 there. And, uh, and then we also have to take into account convection. Wind on the outside means convective heat transfer on the outside, so there's an H associated with that. Uh, F is uh, the inverse of H. Again, this gets into just confusing terminology. We, H is what we use in, in heat transfer, but in uh, uh, sometimes we see it expressed as, uh, uh, as, as F, which, which is the, uh, just the inverse there. Um, I'm sorry, it's not the inverse. F is H. And the reason why some sources use F is H is what? what, what what's another way for enthalpy? Enthalpy. And in order to avoid confusing enthalpy and the heat transfer coefficient, we use the F. Um, and uh, it, 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 there's, there's F, uh, the H or F is, is fairly simple to take into account in our design. Uh, in, when designing for summer, we use uh, seven and a half miles per hour wind, where H is four, or F is four, and in the winter time, we use 15 miles per hour, so we get a little more uh, heat transfer on the outside, H is six. And then inside, where you don't have much air movement, you still have some, and even with no air movement, you have heat transfer by natural convection, right? but smaller heat transfer coefficient uh, inside. So for, a, a, for a, a, a horizontal flow, this would be through a wall, 1.63, and then for the ceiling, um, 1.63. And we get all of these resistances, just add them all up, and calculate an overall U value for the enclosure, for the entire enclosure, roof, ceiling, floor, walls, windows. You, you gather all the terms up, you calculate an overall U, and when you're calculating for heating in winter, you're done. And then in summer, we have to add in the radiation, the solar radiation component, but I'm going to hold off on that. Um, so I, I need to... Uh, add to that part of my, my notes. But let me uh, give you, let's see, I've got something for you to, some examples to apply what we just went through. Take a look at those and um, try to work them 
see what you come up with. We'll go over them at the beginning of class on, uh, on Monday. And uh, yeah, and then we'll move into, uh, we'll add ventilation and infiltration and get a more complete analysis of our space loads.